Well, hey, everybody, welcome to the final lecture uh, for this course. I want to first celebrate you. Um, the, the Bible says those who endure to the end will receive the crown of righteousness. And so well done for running the race and enduring uh, till the end. And in this final lecture, we're going to jump into um, fostering new competencies for the blended ecology. And really, um, this is a kind of a synthesis of everything that we've learned so far, and hopefully a little bit of practical guidance. A lot of times as I have conversations with folks about this and learn from folks and teach about it myself and try to practice this uh, myself, um, the question comes up, okay, so how do I do this from an inherited congregation or a traditional uh, kind of setting? Um, and so I want to share this final um, lecture to kind of jump into some of the nuts and bolts of that. One of the key ideas we've come back to again and again is this image of the church as a living organism, as this resilient tree kind of growing up in the desert through a rock, right? We've looked at Romans 11 uh, several times throughout this course, this idea that Paul talks about the church uh, being rooted in its traditions through Messiah Jesus the matriarchs, the patriarchs, the scriptures, the Torah, um, and these wild branches are being cultivated, uh, being grafted in to this um, cultivated tree, uh, which is against uh, uh, good uh, horticultural practice, right? You usually take um, a wild tree and graft in cultivated branches, and this kind of reverse, taking a cultivated tree and uh, grafting in the wild branches. We talked about this idea of a blended ecology and how the new thing can uh, be in a symbiotic relationship with the uh, fresh things and the seedlings and how those kind of two things give life to each other over time. We looked at that olive tree in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, where these ancient olive trees, 2,000 years old, um, uh, have multiplication built in where these new shoots are kind of springing up. And so there's really three parts of this. Uh, there's cultivating, caring for that tree, trimming it, pruning it, helping it bear fruit, fertilizing it, seeding, casting the seeds of the gospel everywhere, letting it grow wild and uh, native contextual soils, grafting those things together. Remember, we looked at the ketchup and fries plant, that you can grow ketchup and french fries on, your same, on the same plant. Uh, and we talked about how every church was going to have to be a hybrid organism that not only grows potatoes in the ground, but those little tomatoes up top and through grafting, uh, creates this kind of hybrid uh, living thing that can do both. It's a game changer for our potlucks, ketchup and french fries, same plan. Um, and what that can look like in a local church, our inherited congregation can have all these wild branches, both shooting out of the community, being grafted back to the church, shooting out of the church into the community, uh, and being grafted in together. And so literally trying to embody that image that Paul gives us in Romans 11. And if we think of our whole community as our parish uh, and our community as an ecosystem, we've looked at planting churches in first places, second places, third places, and digital spaces. We've looked at kind of contextual uh, praxis for all of that. We looked at this key idea of Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council uh, coming together and um, the tradition blessing the innovation and traditioned innovation taking place where Jerusalem, kind of the decision makers and the inherited church, see this weird uh, boundary crossing thing in Antioch with the Gentiles, and they decide to graft those things together uh, into to, to be an exchange. Uh, and we talked about what that looks like in a modern way when inherited congregations and inherited denominations cultivate these new things, these Antioch looking things, and find ways to support and sustain those over time. We talked about this bounded and centered set evangelism, that in a, a bounded set, there's that gate, and many traditional congregations kind of function like that gated community. There's a clear gate, an access code, uh, and you're, you're in a bounded set. There's a, a, a belief uh, that you're either in or you're out based on that, right, or set of behaviors. In a centered set, we just got a clearly defined center. People are in all different orientations moving towards that center. And your congregation has to decide what that center is. So that is this idea of a blended ecology, their traditional congregation, 
the fresh expressions of church or missional communities or whatever you want to call these things in your context. Um, but they're these little kind of micro churches. So the big question I want to wrestle with in this final lecture is, how do we do this? How do we care for the center and experiment on the edge simultaneously? We're going to have to do both. And so I want to lay out a process for you that comes from the business world that's been helpful for those of us trying to do this blended ecology thing, caring for the center, experimentation on the edge, doing both of those simultaneously. It's a process called dual transformation. This comes from, from some friends um, at um, Harvard, uh, and they wrote a book on this. Uh, you may find that helpful to look at that book, Dual Transformation. Um, dual transformation is about um, companies. Now we're going to take this corporate metaphor. We're going to kind of uh, evaluate it scripturally and then see what parts of it can actually apply to the church and the blended ecology. But this is for companies that figure out they can't just serve the existing customer base, right? They have to serve their existing cu customer base in new and exciting and fresh ways. That's about reinventing today or what they call transformation A. At the same time, they have to do new innovative things. Remember, we talked about the 40-60 problem, fighting in the blood red waters for an existing population of already customers, and we neglect the big blue ocean that can only be reached through innovation. And so they find a way to make innovative products and services to connect with people outside their current customer base. And then there's a capabilities link that flips the dilemma. Um, so usually the dilemma is, do we just kind of really take really good care of our existing customers uh, uh, and put all our energy into that? Or do we put all our energy into this, you know, creating the new thing? And in dual transformation, you have to do both simultaneously and use the resources, the energy, the people power from those two things, feed them into each other. And so we'll look at how to do that in a practical way. Now think of a company like Netflix, obvious example, right? So Netflix uh, reinvented today when they started to send um, DVDs, home entertainment stuff to people's homes, right? Mail order, uh, they sent you your, 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 your DVDs. Uh, and that was innovative. In fact, it was so innovative, some would argue that they put Blockbuster out of business by doing that, right? But then they did this other thing. They started to create a streaming service and they leveraged um, their, their income and their resources from that sending those CDs. They started to invest a lot in this technology where they'd be able to create a streaming service so they could stream into people's homes that media experience. By the way, Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy Netflix when they were in this phase of their development and passed on that. And now we all know the story of that, Netflix and Blockbuster, right? But Netflix didn't really start, start stop there. So they link those things. So they had their streaming service, sending their, their media through the mail. They still do that, by the way. To this day, Netflix still sends DVDs and media materials in the mail. In some places in the world uh, where streaming uh, capabilities limited, they're still doing that, right? Um, but then they decided, so we're going to do another thing. We're going to create our own content. And by such and such a date, we want to stream this much of our own content. So we want to create an original content um, that we ourselves will make. So they start getting into the film industry, the producing industry. Now, much of the content that you see on Netflix is created by Netflix, right? So again, that was an ACB maneuver where they used and leveraged the assets of their current a company to create tomorrow. And so now they're in the business of creating um, uh, their own um, films, uh, series, and all of those things. Some of those um, actually went into theaters and in some ways they bypassed theaters and just kind of changed the whole nature of um, a media experience, right? So that's dual transformation. Now let's take all of that. Let's try to think about it in the context of the blended ecology of church. So in transformation A, this is the inherited, attractional, gathered, analog part of our congregation, right? And so the work there is cultivating that Luke 13, Jesus's tree story. You know, here's a tree. It's not bearing fruit. The owner wants to rip it out. Jesus says, give me three years. Let me fertilize it. Care for it. Let me help it bear fruit. So transformation A is about strengthening the center. It's about tradition and innovation. It's about new and fresh ways uh, to be the church in the traditional inherited sense that we can connect with people uh, outside 
uh, that church and care for the center, the existing people that we have. Transformation B is about that seeding stuff. So we're uh, preparing the soil, we're seeding the new organisms, we're nurturing that growth. That's parable of the sower stuff. We're casting those seeds everywhere. Uh, and that's that emerging, missional, scattered, digital, Antioch kind of stuff we've been talking about. So we're seeding the new things. We're experimenting on the edge. We're doing both of those simultaneously. We're dedicating just as much energy to both equally. And then that capabilities link, flipping the dilemma, that's that grafting part. So we're grafting these two organisms together. We're tethering them. We're connecting. We're not leaving one behind. We're not saying one's better than the other. We're doing both and we're tethering, grafting, connecting like that image in Romans 11 that Paul tells us, deep roots, wild branches. Are y'all with me so far? That whole process we would call dual transformation, what I like to call remissioning congregations. Um, and so that um, uh, uh, process will be kind of a framework to help us here. Uh, so doing all of that together, that's the blended ecology of church. And we need new competencies to do this, right? Because most of us were trained just to do transformation A stuff, if that. Most of us were trained more like to be chaplains of the existing thing, uh, kind of guardians of the status quo, um, good institutionalists who follow the company line and you know do that. Uh, most of our training is geared towards that. So it's going to take new competencies to reinvent today for that transformation A piece and that transformation B piece, experimenting on the edge and linking those things together. Um, so let's start. I want to talk about this as a series of four moves. Um, I've written about this in the book, Deep Roots, uh, Wild Branches, Revitalizing the Church in the Blended Ecology. Um, and those first two moves, I like to call them awakening so we're facilitating a process of coming to, we're awakening congregations from their apostolic amnesia. Many times when we're a gated community, right, and only people that have the secret gate code know how to get in, right, we have to awaken that congregation. That can become like a toxic garden. Uh, it can become a, a dysfunctional thing where it's all about us and taking care of us and the pastor's here to take care of us until we die, right? Uh, and we can't, we can't allow that. We have to awaken the congregation to their true purpose. We have to future fit, which is about restructuring a congregation for the blended ecology way. So let me dig into those a little bit um, as we work on the transformation A side of things. Awakening, future fitting, cultivating and grafting and releasing. That's going to be that transformation B and C linking together stuff. So bear with me here. Let's start with awakening and future fitting. Uh, John 20, I've looked at this verse a lot. It's one of my favorites. Jesus stands in the middle of those cooped up disciples. They're hiding out in their little gated community. He breathes peace and the Holy Spirit on them, sends them out. There's this movement that we talk about in the Missio Dei, which hopefully you are familiar with that now. By the end of this course, you know it inside and out, that we join in God's mission. Uh, it's not our mission, it's God's mission, but we get to participate and co-create and be an instrument of reconciliation and justice, proclaiming the gospel, sharing uh, Jesus in every uh, place and space where we go. And the, we're sent out. Um, uh, so step zero, I would say before you do anything else, before you get to step one, uh, before step one is step zero. And step zero is prayer, right? Remember, we looked at Luke 10. We talked about this. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Pray, Lord, send harvesters. Uh, we did that Luke 10 2 prayer initiative in our church, and then we did it as a whole district uh, over our 87 churches in the North Central District, where we, we encouraged everybody, uh, 15,000 so or so Methodists across the district, to pause at 10.02 a.m. or 10.02 p.m. for the night owls and to pray the missional prayer of Jesus. Some language about ask the Lord of the harvest to send us labors or Lord, send us to the people no one else wants or sees. Lord, awaken us to our, our apostolic purpose. Lord, send us uh, workers for your plentiful harvest field. Prayer. Awakening is about getting people back to the motivation for why we exist. So in the institutional church, it's easy, easy to think that our what is our purpose for being. Remember, we talked about this, that Sometimes the what we perceive is that being packing the butts in the pews, 
filling up the, the offering plates, you know, doing church on Sundays in a traditional setting, having Bible studies and those things. That That's the what, that's not our why, that's not our motivation. And sometimes we have that flipped where we think our motivation is to put butts in pews and nickels and noses, right? That's not what Jesus said. He didn't say, now go and build churches and pack people in the pews and get them to, uh, you know, fill the offering plates, right? That's not what he said. He breathed on them and said, go, just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, go. And we looked at all those different versions of the Great Commission and the Great Commissions, right, that we are called to do. So we have to bring people back to that, that the church is not about you. The, the pastor is not your spiritual butler to just take care of your spiritual needs, right? It, it's not about being religious consumers, but we exist not for ourselves. We're sent out into the world. We're part of the Missio Dei, uh, that Vatican II, the church is missionary by its very nature, right? We have to awaken people to that and the why, the motivation. And that why, that motivation then shapes our how uh, and our what. If our, if our why is clear, then our how and our what will flow from that why. So part of awakening is that. That, that, that involves us looking in our congregations. Remember, we looked at the pioneers, supporters, permission givers, identifying those people, releasing those people, forming teams of those people to go out in the community, connecting with those people that are already out in our communities, getting outside of our buildings and connecting and bringing people onto those teams. We talked a lot about these edge pioneers, these mixed economy pioneers. There's edge pioneers out in our communities doing social justice, doing innovative things, doing entrepreneurial things. And we go out and we partner with those people. We learn from what they're doing and we see how we can support and resource their work. There's those mixed economy pioneers sitting in our congregations already. They come in all shapes and sizes. They can be 20 something year old Kaylee, you know, reading children's books in the library to 30 something year old Denise with 5K Church, uh, Church 3.1 to 80 year old Larry, uh, who's doing, uh, you know, church in the dog park, pause of praise. They're already sitting in our congregations. They maybe don't think of themselves as missionaries or evangelists uh, or apostles, but God has gifted them that, with that. We have to release them out into the community. Remember, those people are going to think a little bit differently, and we need those two gift sets. We talked about those two uh, ways of thinking, that causal logic where we have the means to the given goal, and we just kind of have our steps, and by this year, we're going to have this vision, right? But then we also need the entrepreneurs who just take their means, they take whatever they have, the person, the piece, a, a, a situation, a place, a little bit of resources, they cobble that together, and they start to just go and create and see where these imagined ends can, can lead, and we need both of those. Here's a simple little way to maybe even get this started in your congregation. Um, you can kind of ignore most of this, the key question here is number three. What are your hobbies, interests, passions? What do you love to do in your spare time? You know, people are busy. They tell me, Pastor, I don't have time to do any of this stuff. You know, I just do this or that and I go to work and I, it's hard enough just to come to Bible study or church. Well, we're not asking people to do anything additional to their lives. We're not asking them to add anything. What we're saying is, what are the things you do every week already with, and who do you do it with in the places that you do them with? Uh, what are the practices that are connecting you? What are the places where that happens? We're going to come alongside you, resource you, and equip you to be pastors, uh, ministers, whatever you want to call it in your language that's appropriate for your context. But we're unleashing the whole people of God, the priesthood of believers that we've been talking about throughout this whole course, right? And turning those things that they already do, um, and those networks of people outside the church that they're already involved with, and starting to think about how church and new Christian community can form with those people. That's all about awakening. The second move in this scenario is called future fitting. Future fitting. Now, in um, urban planning, there's a thing called retrofitting. So we know cities are not sustainable. We, we're polluting the earth. We're destroying the earth. We're violating our vocation of creation care. One of God's first calling over humanity is to steward the earth and care for it and be reflect. Uh, reflections of God's imago dei into the world, right? Um, and so retrofitting is about we we bring in new technologies and green technologies. We retrofit cities. We add green spaces. 
to try to make a city more sustainable. Well, I want to talk about future fitting. How do we future fit our churches with the life of heaven now? Uh, how do we have our churches reflect the vision that we see in Revelation 21 and 22 of all the people of the world, of every tribe, space, culture, gathered together around the throne? How does our uh, community start to reflect now a place where the world can come, where the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations, where we gather around the light of Christ, uh, where, where they're, the hungry are fed, where wounds are healed. It, it says there in Revelation that um, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. How do we future fit our communities and our congregations with the life of heaven now? And what this means in, in just simple um, uh, language here is we have to restructure our congregations for this. We have to future fit them for this work. And it's not abandoning the way of doing things for some all new way and saying, you know, we're done with that. It's really this idea of the two wineskins. You can't put old wine into the old wineskin. You can't put a uh, uh, new wine into an old wineskin. It'll burst the skin, right? Jesus is saying, I want to pour this love, this power into you. But if I poured it into you and the rigidity of your thinking, it would blow your mind apart. It would burst you, right? Uh, I got this new fresh wine I want to pour into you. But notice that little and, the very last verse there. But you put new wine in, in, into fresh wine skins, uh, old wine into old wine skins, and both are preserved. And both are preserved. We need both. We need that vintage wine. Uh, that that uh, distinct flavored stuff, right? And we need that fresh stuff, that new stuff. And we need delivery structures for both of those, right? And churches, many churches in many cases are structured in a way that they can't allow for experimentation and innovation because you got to run every single thing through some committee and it dies on the table, right? And you never get started. So the church is geared toward that old wine skin and we need the new wineskins, and we need both of those living together and both to be preserved. So what do you do? Simple thing. Start a fresh expression team, a team in your church that that is their sole purpose is this missional experimentation. You need pioneers and supporters and permission givers on that team. We've talked about those people. We need persons of peace in our orbit who are the welcomers that we can connect with that can open these spaces. These are, these are my teams at my church. We want to have um, a core group of Christians in that team. We want to have the fringe of the core people and the fringe people. So yes, we want solid followers of Jesus. We want people that are still have a life outside the church and they still go to meetings and they still participate in PTAs and take their kids to stuff or play soccer or whatever. There's a multitude of things. We need those people part of our teams. We can't just have it everybody whose whole life is centered in the church. We need fringe people who may or may not be Christian, right? They, they, they may be the tattoo parlor owner or the manager at Moe's Southwest Grill or the yoga instructor that we know, but there are people who maybe they're not even Christian yet, but we partner with them, we collaborate with them, we bring them onto our team and they help shape what we're doing. We people map our ecosystem. We look at our community, get with your team, get out a whiteboard or a, a, a stick up paper draw out on there your home base where is our base of operation where has god called us to like center ourselves where, what's our antioch or our jerusalem if you will and then draw out what what's happening in your community community centers um uh, where do different people hang out and live and eat and play housing developments and parks and condos and restaurants and coffee shops write descriptions of those things understand your context in your community with your team pray over that. Say, do we have a person of peace in that single family home development or in that old supermarket or in that coffee shop? Do we, do we have, is God calling us uh, to form some kind of community there? Viralize this vision in your congregation. Preach mission. Teach it. Talk about it all the time. Awaken the congregation. Remind them in every way that you can in love. Speak the truth in love that we exist not for ourselves. We got to get out there. We got to, everybody, everybody's got to call no pew potatoes. We got to unleash the whole people of God. If you're going to be a part of this church, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be about the mission of God. Create your own seminary. We have the underground seminary in our church. We try to train our lay people. We give our theological educations away for free to them so that they can be empowered as leaders in the world. Mobilize the congregation. Get them out in the community. 
we actually told everybody in our whole district, we had a steeple to streets day and we actually did it as a whole conference in Florida uh, uh, to go out in the streets and to do a couple of things. Uh, I wanna share that with you, to pray, observe and encounter. If you're really bold, you can even people tell people, we're not gonna have church Sunday because we're gonna go out and do this instead. We're gonna go out in the community and do this. This is what we did. So we, uh, we've been doing this every year. We started this thing. We did it at my church first, and we did it as a district, and then as a whole conference. What would 13,628 Methodists going out into the world, praying, observing, and encountering? So when we started to, to do this, to get people out of their uh, congregations and out in the community, all we asked them to do was pray, observe, and encounter, find the third places, look for persons of peace that are out there in that community, and then we planned a way for them to kind of report back what they saw. So we made it simple. We created these little bulletin inserts. We made these for them and printed them for them. And we helped however we could to get this done. We told them to form a team, uh, find a place you're going to visit on this day where we're going to go out, mobilize the congregation, uh, pray, observe, encounter. And then we gave them those little cutoff pieces to say who they were, what church they were from, where'd they go, who'd they meet, what did God show them, what's next, how can we help? So they went out and they took in all that data and they said, you know, we saw these people on Sundays, they were hanging out in the park or they were playing soccer, or they were doing any, everything but church. We were the only ones at the church. Everyone else was just going about life. They made these observations and then we helped them um, kind of see how those, those observations had missional opportunity. And we just continue to identify and train and release these people through workshops and trainings and sermons and immersive um, experiences. Our bishop has said this. I shared this earlier. A little reminder, the time of the professional minister is over. The time of the missionary pastor has come. We're going to have to be just as much missionaries as we are pastors. This whole idea of the 50-50, uh, this is about future fitting, friends, that we spend half our energy caring for the center half our energy experimenting on the edge and doing those things equal and seeing them as equally important. This 50-50 planner is a helpful tool for that, right? Where we have our day, we mark out our Sabbath. Uh, the Lord commands Sabbath. Pastors, I'm talking to you. The Lord commands Sabbath. Um, that's one day that gets checked right off the list. You should probably have another day that's dedicated just to your family that you don't do any work or school or anything related to the church. With the five days you have left or the two days you have left or the three days, whatever your work schedule, if you're a 10 hour a week pastor or 20 hour a week, then you block it out. On that eight to 12 block, if you've got me working at eight to 12 at the church and 12 to five at the church, don't expect me to come in five to nine on a meeting, right? You don't work for the church from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m that is not healthy. Do not do that, right? But we can, we can use this tool to have a conversation with our leadership. Whatever time you have left, then you start to split it up in this 50-50 way. So we say Tuesday, 8 to 12, I'll go do hospital visits or home visits or see people in the office or whatever. But tw uh, Wednesdays from 12 to 5, I'm going to be out in the community. I'm going to be at that burrito joint that just opened, hanging out, getting to know people's names, hearing their stories. And that's my work for the church too. It's not just when I come into the office that I'm working for the church, but when I'm out in the community, I'm working for the church, right? And then instill this culture and this ethos in the whole congregation. Your staff should be living this out. Half your stuff do that inside the church, half be out there connecting with people. Your laity who are part of the church, don't spend all your time at the church. Spend half your time doing things that we need you to do at the church. Spend the other half of time, whatever free time you have left, out in the community, connecting with people, doing this stuff. Remember that grid that we looked at in this blended ecology? We need to have physical, attractional forms of ministry. So worship services, Bible studies at the church, compound, uh, dry, you know, dinners and food pantries and all those things. Attractional digital. So we stream our worship service to our existing congregation. We're taking care of them using digital technologies. Uh, if that's phone conferencing for you, whatever that is. Then on the other side, on this, um, you know, uh, transformation B side, we're doing physical incarnational ministry. We're out in the community. We're cultivating church with people that don't go to church. And then in the incarnational digital side, we're doing that 
by uh, creating Facebook groups and Zoom rooms and using Meetup to connect with people online um, who probably will only always be online. They'll, they'll never walk into our church uh, and doing all of that. This is a little um, uh, fresh expression sheet. You can take a picture of this and use it with your team. Um, and uh, uh, just kind of gives you, a, for those of you that are in the causal logic way, uh, there's your affinity group, the need, um, the, the fresh expression or the new Christian community you're proposing to meet them. Um, how are you going to do it? Who's going to do it? Who's not going to be reached if you don't do it? Where are the potential places? And then get literally into those action steps. Who's going to be responsible? When's it going to be done? Who should do it? Fill this thing out. Get your team really working. But I would say don't let this be a barrier like to starting. Just start ugly. Get out there. Try it. If we overthink it, typically we'll, we'll never start. So all of that's kind of that transformation A sign. We're future fitting the congregation. We're awakening the congregation. We're, we're doing all of that. Um, uh, uh, reinventing the today for the existing congregation. Now let's move just briefly into this cultivating and grafting transformation B. Uh, this is about creating a new future for people outside the church. Um, so this is about that seeding, casting the seeds of the gospel, the new things, experimenting on the edge. This is about linking, grafting those things together, that whole uh, idea of feedback looping, which we'll look at here, the whole thing together, we call that dual transformation. So this is all that we've done. I had two different lectures on this, so I'm not gonna rehash all of this, um, but it's that process, that journey that we looked at from listening to church tape, taking shape to doing it again. We talked about those bridge backs that anywhere in that journey, people come to faith and they go, you know, I think I'll go check out the inherited congregation. I think the key thing there is when they come to do that, what are we bringing them to? You know, that's a, that's a really important opportunity when people make that journey back to the inherited church. Uh, it, we need to be careful what we're bringing them back into. If we're bringing them into an ecosystem of toxicity uh, and, and, and judgment and all of that, I wouldn't even try to get people to come back until you have something to bring them to. So what we did was we created an alternative thing. We call it new life. It's a fourth place. It's a worship experience in between a fresh expression and a traditional church um, that we wanted to make sure that we had something they would be comfortable with, that it would be close to what they've experienced in a fresh expression, and it wouldn't be like a totally foreign experiment. Some of those things are going to go out on the edge. You're going to start stuff. It's not going to ever become a church. That's okay. It's just what God's called us to do. We listen, we love, we build community, we explore discipleship because that's what God's called us to do. This is going to cause a little bit of a shift on the transformation B side. Our monologues, our 30 minute sermons are not going to work. Um, the young people that I talk to, all these people in these fresh expressions, they kind of say a similar thing. You know, I want to I want to be spiritual. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to even explore what church could look like. But I feel like every time I go to church, it's somebody telling me what I have to do and what I have to believe rather than I just want to sit down with somebody and have a conversation about Jesus. I want to ask questions. I want to wonder. I want to, you know, explore the mystery of this and what people are really longing for in emerging generations is a lot less monologue preaching at people. And it's a lot more dialogical and conversational and creating space for that. That's what we're doing in the Fresh Expressions, whether that's in the tattoo parlor or a Zoom room or a, a, a burrito joint or a runner's track. We're having sermonic conversations. And it's very, very much the way that Jesus taught. Jesus didn't do a lot of uh, uh, monologues. He did some, like the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Uh, but mostly Jesus um, used dialogues. Herman Horn has a great book, a uh, very old book, Jesus, the Master Teacher. He talked about how Jesus gave people attention. He connected with them. He was interested in people and their needs. He was out in the midst of them, like where they lived and where they did life. Uh, and he was connecting, creating a point of contact with people. Um, then the next thing he did um, was, you know, uh, uh, ask questions, tell stories, share parables, Jesus asked a total of 307 questions, according to Martin Copenhaver, and there's different um, scholars who record a different number of questions, but it's a lot of questions, okay? He gave a lot more 
questions and dialogues than he ever did monologues. In his teaching, people would ask questions, he would respond to questions. He would create parables that really ask questions and people could find themselves in that story and that parable. And then he invited people to kind of participate in that. We talked about those key questions, those four questions, remember? If the story happened today, what would it look like? Those are dialogical, conversational questions. It's not about monologuing people and telling them. It's about inviting them into a story and, and to share their um, you know, feelings about the story. The final move in this is about releasing. Remember, we talked about the wolves of Yellowstone who changed the rivers when we released the wolves. We talked about living in a church that's kind of a learned helplessness, artificial ecosystem where we've created like clergy dependency. And the pastor is at the center of the congregation and everybody's dependent on the pastor for the religious goods and services. And in the sense, we've created an artificial ecosystem like Yellowstone without wolves. We got to release the wolves. It's going to be messy. It's going to be disruptive. Uh, and it's going to, it's going to uh, cause us to take a different posture in ministry and to trust the Holy Spirit. Um, but this is uh, about releasing the APAS, the Apostles, the Prophets, Evangelists, Shepherds, Teachers. Uh, we talked so much about, you know, exiling the apes and all of that. So how do we now we've got these things going, the, these experiments we're releasing. How do we connect this and make sure it doesn't come apart on us? Well, th there's a helpful um, in complexity thinking idea called feedback loops. Uh, and that's how outputs of a system get rerouted back into inputs and they form a loop. So this is that grafting. This is that grafting part. Small little inputs fed back into a system can change the whole system. In, lay, in layman's terms, so congregations, when we feed the uh, experimentation and the energy that's happening out in, on the edge back into the center, it creates change, right? So what do we do? We have a missions moment in worship where we talk about the things that are happening in Tattoo Parlor Church or Dog Park Church. We show stories and pictures and videos of those things that are happening. Then we celebrate the inherited congregation. And we say, thank you for your faithfulness, your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness. Look at what your faithfulness is enabling on the edge. You are part of this. So it's not, we're not leaving the inherited congregation behind. We're not saying we're doing this new thing and you know, you're irrelevant. We're saying, look at how you're equipping and unleashing this. You can join into it too, if you like, if you have an idea, something you want to do, but here's the things that are happening on the edge, right? That's feedback looping. That's giving people input. That's inviting people and in then here to congregation, come out, check out Tattoo Parlor Church, see what it's like, see people's lives being transformed, right? Even uh, the starting a small feeding program and, and uh, can have massive change. Having the congregation fill their blessing bags that we pass out with those that are experiencing homelessness. Um, that can have massive change. We connect with Pastor Taylor in the Martin Luther King Jr. building. We're doing our connect. We're doing our breakfast church. Pastor Taylor says, hey, I need a space, a building. We're planting a church here. We say, hey, guess what? We have a building. We go back to the inherited congregation and say, Pastor Taylor needs a building, and we got one. We're going to let him come and meet here. We're not going to charge him anything. And feedbacking that into this uh, very racist, historically congregation changed the whole thing, created a multicultural, uh, multiracial congregation, right? So we're feedbacking things in and out, uh, and, and, and that's all about um, that grafting piece. And we're looking for the positive defiance. I think Jesus was a positive deviant, by the way. Um, and this refers to a, a, an approach to social change. Uh, that in any system, in any community, there are deviants whose uncommon but successful strategies help them find better solutions to a problem than their peers, even though they face the exact same similar challenges. Um, so we are looking for those people in our congregation that are the deviants. Maybe they don't think the same. Maybe they ask troublesome questions. Maybe they do things that we even think they're crazy. Well, we need to give those people some space. And so what I do in my work across the Florida conference with 625 congregations, I'm looking for those positive deviants. I'm looking for the people who had a church of 12 people and it's now 100. What did they do different? What kind of we learn from them? I'm looking for the pioneers who are out on the edge doing stuff that uh, is, is not typically or orthodox kind of way of being ministry. And I'm learning from them. 
And we have a blended ecology conference. So uh, alongside those 625 congregations, we now have about 300 fresh expressions of church emerging out. So if you think, how can I do this on a small little scale in a church? Uh, it, it, uh, you may be thinking, well, I'm in a large church, or I'm a, I'm a denominational figurehead, or I'm in a district uh, superintendent or leader. This can be a thing that we apply to a whole area, state, region, um, a whole mission field, really, the United States. We need a blended ecology. And that's about finding those positive deviants and then feeding their learnings and feeding their deviation back into the system. So we have to equip, encourage, build habitats of opportunities for those positive deviants. When people come to me with a crazy idea, I celebrate it. I try to look for a way to say yes. I ask, is this a good idea or a God idea? And the way that I think about that is, is this person called to do this? Um, will people come to know Jesus if they do it that wouldn't if they didn't do it? Um, do they have a person at peace? right? Um, it, do they have a team? Uh, I don't, people should not start these things without a team. And then I move, my role is not to regulate or to stop or to manage or to like own, but it's to resource. So it's about moving from regulation to resource. It's about moving from positional, uh, pyramidal, like I'm the pastor, you're going to do what I say kind of leadership to a shared uh, communal and perichoritic, this is a, a word for the Trinity, the perichoresis, the movement of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this dance of leadership. So uh, it's, it's a different kind of leadership that this is gonna require. So I wanna show you a quick little video to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, and this is one model. So you get the idea there. It's, um, you know, the leader is up on the pedestal with, with the pre-directed sheet music, and we're going to guide the group through what they're going to play. It's easy to go on a power trip on that kind of leadership, right? Because people move to your, your will and how you direct and guide. Everything's predetermined, essentially. So there's that Mr. Bean kind of leadership that we're programmed for in the attractional church. I want us to consider another uh, style and way of leadership here. So let's watch this quick little clip here from my friend, Miles Davis. Okay, so you, you get the, the, the idea there. So improvisation, the difference between uh, an orchestra with a conductor and a jazz uh, band. So Miles just kind of comes in, starts to play, and the band starts to like feed off of what he's doing. Each person takes their part in the song, right? And they're just kind of riffing and improvising as they go along and creating a song, creating music together as a community of equals. So that's a little different way of thinking about leadership, possibly, than many of us have thought about it. The, the, uh, one of the things from the corporate world, like bleeding into the church, is we follow this kind of hierarchy of ego, CEO, executive team, employees, right? And then your, your, your congregants um, kind of function like that. That's not really the way that Jesus designed the church, though, is it? Um, this is a school of fish. And have you ever noticed in a school of fish, the fish move in a kind of uh, 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 synchronicity. They're, they're, they're synced together and they're communicating somehow and they move in this beautiful dance and rhythm. There's not really a leader in that group, right? But they're, they're synced and they're moving, right? Uh, I, I think of like the, the, the shared leadership trinity kind of way in this. Here's a, a, a murmuration of starlings kind of creating this beautiful image and again, they move and they sink and they uh, at the direction of the wind and they create these beautiful patterns and they just kind of dance across the sky. There's not really a leader in this. Uh, they're all leading together. They're a community of equals and they're synced in the spirit and moving, right? 
And this uh, way of leadership is going to take a little bit of that. Here's the final thing I'll, I'll say. Uh, we have to be clear about how we're discipling people um, in, the, in, this, uh, in, the, uh, in this pattern. Um, so people often go, well, how does this not go off the rails? And how do people not go rogue on you and start cults or whatever? Well, this is really the key part. Um, Jesus uh, had some, some clear like inner circle folks, right? He had Peter, James, and John. Obviously, he took them up on the mountain, right? They saw the transfiguration. He also had some women, by the way, Luke 8, and some women uh, who also were his inner circle, who traveled with him everywhere he went, who uh, out of their own resources uh, funded the ministry, it tells us there, uh, that some of these women were wealthy and they, they were right there along with the guys, but the gospels were written by men, let's be honest. So the women get kind of a little short uh, snippet, although they were just th there and just as faithful. And then um, there's, you know, like Lazarus, Martha, Mary, whom the Bible says the disciple he loved, uh, who he went to spend time with, like this was his uh, away from the disciples, uh, away from where he could go and talk about, man, this guy, Peter, tried to jump out of a boat last week and almost drowned himself, right? So Jesus had these relational kind of circles, the inner circle. He had the 12, obviously, that were some were part of that. They're kind of in and some kind of on the edge. Then we see in Luke 10, that 72 that we've been looking at all through this course. Then by the time we get to Acts, you know, you've got the 120 gathered in prayer, the faithful ones waiting for the spirit. Then you've got crowds and then you've got the world. So through these intimate relationships, these couple people, through these kind of relational circles, Jesus actually reaches the whole world, right? So we tried to conceptualize what this looks like at our church and my wife and I, co-pastors, we have some people that are discipling us. I think that's the key. You never outgrow being discipled by somebody. Um, and we have some, some elder sages, some wisdom, uh, uh, some folks who are discipling us. We don't outgrow that. We're, that's a lifelong thing. Uh, we have our pastoral team who more, there are in, inherited church folks. And then we have our pioneer team. These are the ones that are doing all these fresh expressions and stuff. Uh, remember transformation a and b and like two teams for both of those and then we bring them all together once a month but these are people that we spend a lot of time with they have full access to us they text us they call us you know we're available to them we're discipling them um, our kids are obviously in that inner circle we feel like discipleship with them is really uh, one of the most important things in our life and our family but as we invest in those people right? Then they're going out and they're investing in the, the, the group of 20 key leaders in our congregations. Then the larger congregation, then this network of fresh expressions that we have spread all over, then the district, the conference, and the world. And so through those couple groups with those intimate relationships, we're actually reaching a lot of people through that. Uh, we have a discipleship covenant. We believe that God works in covenants from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, and uh, that's just a relationship with clear boundaries. And so ours, this is not in any way like us saying, this is what you should do. I'm just trying to describe what we do to maybe um, you know, give you a vision or a dream or, or to at least be um, uh, think about what you're doing in your discipleship process. But we took the 12 steps of AA back to the original six steps um, that were developed by AA out of the Oxford Group Principles, which, by the way, was a Christian uh, group, Christian temperance movement um, that was created by Lutheran priest Frank uh, Buckman, who uh, um, created this uh, Oxford Group. And we have our people go through this. So it's six steps. Surrender uh, to a covenantal apprentice relationship. You're going to be in a relationship with a sponsor or a discipler, if you will, who follows Jesus, right? inventory. So we do an examination of our souls uh, and we, we, we do pen and paper and we look at all that, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Confession, right? James 5. So we get together in these apprenticeship relationship. We confess our sins one to another so we'll be healed. Amends. We have a guided process where we help people right all the wrongs in their life. Um, and and uh, this biblical idea, if you owe somebody something, go fix that before you bring your gift to the altar. And then there's this continued growth, the ongoing uh, inventory and confession, continuing to grow in the likeness of Jesus. And so we have practices and check-ins and all of that. 
and then finally we disciple others so we we as we go through this journey with our uh, uh, discipler we're going to go back and do that with other people and so we create a culture of discipleships uh, people paired up going through this process and holding each other accountable uh, and if you want to use the word accountable there's relational um, credibility and uh, uh, currency and investment in these relationships and so when somebody's starting to go off the rails we can go you know it really looks like you're struggling with that are you okay can I help you can I pray for you what are you going through and so we create that kind of relational synergy and then we um, let people go uh, in that and we walk alongside them as they create and cultivate and, and do those things. So again, I know that is a lot of stuff I just threw at you, just trying to give you some new uh, competencies for a blended ecology. Uh, uh, you've been a wonderful class. Thank you. Uh, great conversations, great work on your papers. And um, please continue to follow. Um, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can share the YouTube channel with your friends if you want to keep up with uh, lectures and those kind of things. As we go along, I would, I would love and welcome that. So thank you, everybody. Hope this course was formational uh, and helpful. Um, hopefully, uh, it was not just an impartation of knowledge uh, thing, but it, you grew in Christ, maybe found some freedom in your own calling to be who you really are, and uh, maybe a new angle to look at um, how to be the church on this new missional frontier. That's my hope and my dream, that people will come to know Jesus through you in your ministry, in your churches. And so God bless you and go in God's peace and remember that you're sent and remember uh, to remind your people that they're sent as well. God bless everybody.